I don't know much about this, but in, in investigating it, studying this week and praying and asking the Lord about the word this week, um, I, I thought about the uh, something that I learned. It was called the Stockholm Syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome. I think, okay, something to do with Sweden or something like that. Um, and then in tandem with that, um, there's the ICD-9 code 995.81. Now, aren't you impressed? But I remembered that. They're in tandem, these two things. Two different things, but in tandem. And the way they're in tandem is an abnormal mindset. An abnormal mindset. This is the way it goes. Stockholm syndrome is an ab- abnormal mindset that says, it's, it's spoken of about people who have been captured, people who have been held hostage, people who have been kidnapped. And the Stockholm syndrome goes something like this, of the person who's been captured, and I don't know where your mind goes, maybe somebody's tied up in a chair, maybe somebody's, you know, locked up in a closet someplace in a cabin in the woods or whatever it may be that pops into your mind. But the way it works is this person who has been captured begins to hear the story of the person who has kidnapped them, the person who's holding them hostage. And they start hearing it and they, they start seeing that, wow, that's a, that's a real person right there. Maybe they even begin to agree with some of the causes of what they're trying to prove. Uh, But that quickly moves to some kind of emotive connection and they actually begin to grow in some level of fondness for their captor. And and then if it it proceeds, they can almost get to the the idea, the understanding of, of joining them. I mean, you've heard of stories of people who, even children who have been captured age 10, 11, or 12 and held for more than a decade or something like that, only to hear the police department and the investigation start to look into it and begin to wonder, well, now, wait a minute. Was this person in on it? And what they discovered, no, is this Stockholm syndrome of a person who's kept like this, whose mindset, albeit wrong, has taken off in a destructive pattern. Or or that other ICD-9 code 995.81. What is that? Well, that's more popularly known as the battered person syndrome. It used to be just the battered wife, but now it's the battered uh, person syndrome. And and that's the kind of one, again, you've seen it. You've seen it in movies and different things. Hopefully you haven't experienced it too much. It's a terrible thing. It's where this person, many, many times, a wife who has been battered, but they look into the issues of, of why she doesn't press charges, why she continues to go back. And, and they look into that mindset and they begin to see, wow, she's actually thinking that this is her fault. She's beginning to think that there's no place else to turn, that she's trapped, that her self-worth is wrapped up in this person who's beating her. Moreover, this kind of They call it a disease or mindset that goes on. Begins to believe that this person who's beating them up is all-powerful and and omnipresent. That is, they're they're ever... No, I I, I can't talk to you. I can't go over... No, couldn't go down there and talk to them looking for help because he might find out that I was down. They begin to have this kind of attitude that this person is everywhere and they, they can see everything and they'll figure out everything and they're just kind of trapped. And really, it's, it's my fault anyway because, you know, he asked me to cook him two eggs, one fried and one scrambled, and I fried the wrong one. Making light of something incredibly serious, I know. 
Wow, that is a very, very destructive mindset to be in. Now, here's the apology. Those are very, very serious things. And they grip many, many homes. And I I don't want to take something that's so serious in our society uh, for a, for a, 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 just a sermon illustration and that it goes on. And, and in some respects, by way of these mindsets that are so destructive, I, I don't want to make light of them. I would prefer that what I'm going to apply it to would become more severe in your mindset. Did you follow all that? Blah, blah, blah. I don't want to. I don't want to just use those in some way as an illustration. Let's just move on. Forget about those. But I'm using them because I want to press on your brain, on your mind, on your heart, the seriousness of what I'm going to say to you today. Because here's where I'm going with those illustrations. We can get into destructive mindsets. We can get into patterns of life, of thinking about very serious things that God cares about very, very deeply. We can be as deceived as some people in those kinds of situations, thinking that I'm doing what is right and be headed in a destructive pattern of life. We can be that deceived. Now, the reason I'm using the severe illustrations like that, and the reason that I'm saying that is because the Bible says that Satan is in the world and he's roaming to and fro. And he's not just roaming to and fro to see whose favorite pen got lost or even whose car tire blew out or even so much as someone who can't pay the mortgage. But he's walking to and fro to see who he can devour. And if we, the church, do not take up the charge of God seriously, but think that the mission of the church is something else, we are in a destructive pattern of thinking. And to be clear, who gets destroyed? We get destroyed. Oh, preacher, wait a minute. You need to read your Bible a little bit better. The Bible says that the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. And I believe that with my whole heart. There's no question about that. But I want you to know, we live in a world that does not. Remember the eschatology that we did? Remember what I said about over-realized eschatology? There's no question that one day we will live in that kingdom triumphant as the church triumphant. But presently we live in the midst of spiritual warfare. The place of already, yes, we're in Christ, but not yet, not consummated victory. And the devil is walking to and fro to see whom he may devour. Begin today in the church, begin today in the sermon about the church, for about the next eight, nine weeks together, we're going to talk about that portion in our vision statement. We seek to be a word-saturated, joyfully reformed, transformational community to the glory of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're going to talk in the next few weeks together about this portion of of our vision statement, what it means to be a transformational church. What does it mean to be a transformational church? Now, we're going to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So would you go in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 3? 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And today I just want to talk about two things as I try and define what does it mean to be a transformational church? Now, as you're turning, though, my personality kind of comes out. Maybe it was because of a lack of acceptance as a young lad or whatever. And 
and, and I do this quite often, but right now I want to talk to you for a moment about what it doesn't mean, or at least something that's in my mind about what it doesn't mean. And that's this. That preacher, what do you mean transformational church? Where are we going now? What new program has the church come up with? Haven't we been through this? We did this kind of a study four years ago, and then we did another study, and we did something else, and isn't this the, just the next thing that's kind of rolling off the, the assembly line? Furthermore, you know, I, I, I'm really kind of tired of talking about everything that's negative about the church and what has to change about the church. Well, what I want to say to you is, is first of all, what the transformational church actually is saying is, is nothing. When I say, what do you mean by transformational church? The first thing that kind of pops into this brain, these cobwebs of mine is nothing. Or at least nothing new. Maybe framed in a different way, but really nothing new. What does it mean to be a transformational church? It means to be the body of Christ on mission for God. Period. That's it. Let's go home. Nothing new in in some sense. The other thing that I would want to say before I turn to the text here is that just because you say transformational, to be transformed, doesn't necessarily mean from something bad to something good. As we'll see in the text here in just a moment. It's a growing process, a transformational. Even that that title slide that I was using, you looked up at it. Yeah, that's that whole butterfly kind of cocoon thing that you learned about in fourth grade. Uh, the reason for that is, is as we turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I'm going to highlight verse 18, and I'm going to read it right now. We've already read it once today. But then I'm going to back up. We're going to take a look at learning a little bit about what the Bible has to say right here and then how we're to apply it to our lives. But I'm looking at verse 18, and I see, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed being transformed. And you see in your bulletin there, we might get that English word metamorphosis there from them. Metamorpho, oh my, is the Greek word. Metamorpho, oh my. That's the verb. In this case, in this place here in the text, it's a present participle. We're being transformed. And in the original language, when something's in the present tense, it's an ongoing, it's a continual action kind of a thing. And so not only are we being transformed now, we're, we're continuing to be being transformed on and on and on. And that's that verb in the Greek language, metamorpho, oh my, kind of fun to say. Say it about 10 times and, and you'll have it. You see that being changed. Well, let's take a look at the context of what Paul is talking about here so that we make sure that we understand this verse in the way that the Lord wants us to. So here, Paul, in chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians, now we call it 2 Corinthians, it most probably is 3 Corinthians. We have 1 Corinthians that we can read through, but probably there was a letter, most more, more definitely a letter in between the two that we don't have. Probably a letter that Paul sent to the people at Corinth that pretty much chastised them, pretty much stuck his bony finger out in their face and said, I have some serious challenges with you. Because in this letter, he writes about a severe letter a severe statement that he made to them. And his reluctance to come back to them with a severe tone again. And so therefore he he writes here, and I'm over in chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, are we being uh, beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation? He said, we don't need any letters of recommendation because you are our letter. The fact that you are following Christ proves our ministry, is what he's saying there. And uh, then begins to talk about the different kinds of ministry and relates them to the Old Testament. Look at verse 3. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, 
but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human heart. Now, when the word tablets comes to you, not tablets of stone, what do you think of? Think of the Ten Commandments, don't you? Sure. So let's look a little bit further. That's Moses and the Ten Commandments, verse 7. Now, excuse me, verse 4. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So now I'm a minister of a new covenant, not the old covenant, not the covenant of Moses and the Ten Commandments, but of the Spirit that gives life. Verse 7. Now if the Spirit of death carved in letters on stone, wow, Romans tells us that the law bring, can only bring about death. And so he says here, now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I read Paul, he's really going with these tongue twisters or these mind teasers. And he kind of goes back and forth, and I have to read it two or three times to to try and get the understanding of it. He's simply saying here that there was a time when those, those letters written on stone had glory. They've come to an end, he says, but they used to have glory. And now what we have is the Spirit of God who is written on our hearts. Now, if that had glory, this, wow, this has got more glory. This is even better. Now, let's continue. Verse 9, for if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about this in weeks to come. But right now, I just simply want to say, he's saying that those letters written on the stone, they could only do one thing in your life. And they were meant to. So that's why he also says it was good. But they could only do one thing. And that was, tell you you're wrong. Tell you you're wrong. Tell you you're wrong. I had a friend in high school. He was beginning to think that he was a stand-up comedian. And at times he was funny, but one of his little gigs, one of his little gags, one of his little things was, um, was in, in, in three-year-old fashion to come up and put his finger in my chest, literally touching it all the time, and just say, liar, liar. No matter what I said, it didn't matter. I think the Colts are going to win this weekend. Liar. 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 Just just continually. He thought it was funny. I tell you, I don't... I I didn't play basketball in high school. I wrestled. I tell you what, I wanted to grab that guy and throw him... Liar. Liar. And, and, and the physical contact had something to do with it too. Liar. Liar. You ready for me to stop this illustration? Huh? Liar. <laughs> That's all the law can do. That's all the law can do. The law can't take you past that place. It can't do it. Now let's go on in the text. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. It's not that all of a sudden it became bad. This is so important I could just stop right here. This is really how you live out the Christian life. And when we get to 18, I, I want to press it home even more. It's not that the tables of stone, that the letters on the tables of stone, automatically God said, that's bad. What he did was he brought something that was so much better that you wouldn't even think about that. That's Paul's theology, and I could bring it out so many different ways, but I I hesitate. 
for, in verse 11, if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope in verse 12, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hard. Now, some of you might know all, not all of this because you hadn't studied this Old Testament. If you're kind of a novice to the Bible and, and you're, you're growing in it, you might not. Paul uses this language about Moses. Let's just go back there for just a moment. And, and, and this is the scene that Moses, the Bible tells us, led the people wandering in the wilderness during a period of time. This Moses and the children of Israel who were following him would travel around the Sinai Peninsula and before they entered into the Promised Land, which is now present-day Israel, they were wandering around. And the Bible says that they were led by a pillar, a cloud by day and by fire by night. And the Bible says that actually when we talk about this aimless wandering around, it's not true. Actually, God was directing the whole way. And a cloud would raise up in the daytime and it would go out like this. And the Bible says, whenever that cloud stopped and sat down, Moses, that's where I want you to camp. And you can see it at night because it's a pillar of fire by night. So keep following it this way. And when that stops and plants down there, that's where I want you and all the people to camp. I want you to put the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, in the center and let all the people live around it. And Moses, when you go into that particular tent, into the Holy of Holies, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to talk to you face to face. So that's what Moses did in the Old Testament. He did that. They camped. And Moses from time to time would go into that temple. And after he came back out from that temple... His face was shining. In fact, his face was shining to the extent that the people are looking at Moses and they're afraid of him. So Moses, so that the people wouldn't be afraid of him, after he'd gone in and come back, put a veil over his face to hide his face so the people wouldn't see it glowing. This is what Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians right here. So I'll go back to 12 again. Since we have such a hope, We are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. Well, Moses would go in, he'd talk to God, God would give him the commandments, the laws that he wanted to tell the people, and so he would go back out. But he put a veil over his face so that when he told them the laws, they wouldn't be afraid because his face was glowing. So that's what he means by his ministry that was coming to an end. Because it wouldn't continue. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted. Because only through Christ it is taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. So Paul is using some analogy, some language to say to the Jews during his time, his audience there, and there was a mixed group in Corinth, both Jews and Gentiles. To this day, it's like they can't see. Their eyes are blinded. Even when Moses is read today, they're not turning. They're not obeying because there's a veil. There's a veil there. But now it says in the Lord Jesus... That veil is lifted and we can now see. So let's read it. But when one turns to the Lord, in 16 again, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all say, now who's who's all? Who's Paul saying? We all who know the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we all with unveiled face. Now we all unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The Bible says, now here it comes, 
The Bible says that anybody who knows the Lord, the veil has been lifted and you, if you know him, are being changed. That is not an invitation to be changed. That is a declaration of your current condition. That is not an invitation. You're not going to see as an application of this sermon. I beg of you to be transformed by the Spirit of God. I'm not going to do that. I am going to ask you, is there evidence that you're being transformed? Can I look at my watch? I'm just talking to you. There are times, much like that battered syndrome, that I, okay, I'll admit, I listen to AM radio. And every now and then might be late at night, especially when I used to preach all over the land. I'd be driving back late at night. And Dr. Laura would be on. Anybody ever heard Dr. Laura? I appreciated at least something about Dr. Laura. Dr. Laura would be on the phone talking to to a gal and and say, well, tell me the situation. Well, I've been married to this guy for three years and really not the kind of guy that that I thought that he was. And the other day he pushed me. First time he's ever done that. Oh, really, she says. And has he ever done this? Well, yeah, he did that. And, uh... Has he ever stayed out and done that? Yeah. And, you know, she goes through her list. I'm trying to be quick about this because it really wasn't in the sermon notes. But she gets to a place, she says, something like, I mean, it's just me. It's just trying to be. So are you thick-headed or something? I mean, what do you have in there that you call a brain? Are you just a blockhead? What do you mean to tell me that after he, he's hit you, he stay out all night, he treats the kids terrible, that he's really a good guy? He's not a good guy. And he doesn't love you. Wake up! Now you already figured out the application, didn't you? Don't tell me you love Jesus. Don't tell me you love what Jesus loves. Don't tell me as a member of the transformed community of Christ that you're being changed daily from one degree of glory to another when you're not. When you're not. There's no evidence that you You're the same today as you were yesterday, that you were last week, that you were last year. Now, I'm not trying to beat the sheep today. But I'm saying by the Spirit of God, if there is no change, I'm not telling you to to change. I'm telling you to continue to read the book of 1 Corinthians. Eventually, I'm going to get to the place where it says, test yourself to see if you're in the Spirit. Do you not know that it is Christ who is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. The text in 3.18 doesn't challenge the Second Corinthians to be transformed, to change. It says, if the Spirit of God is in you, you are changing. That's the first thing that a transformational community means. And the second thing, from first, excuse me, from 2 Corinthians 3.18, quickly over to 2 Corinthians 5.18. And I'll do this, but we're going to spend the next nine weeks unpacking this together. Maybe not from just the same text, but from 2 Corinthians. And unlike my normal pattern that I begin in chapter 1, verse 1, and go through the book, I'm just going to choose out text from 2 Corinthians for the next about eight, nine weeks together. But take a look now. Before we finish today, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. I'll go back a little bit to verse 16, the beginning of the paragraph. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creator. It doesn't say. 
What I want you to do is make yourself a new creation. It says that you are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now 18. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sakes he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We've been given an incredible I, I, just, I just like the way the text says it. I started writing in my notes and started trying to speak to you about the, the ministry of reconciliation that we have. And the text says, I love the word, so would you pay attention to it? The text says, you've been entrusted. Let that sink in for a second. Let it sink in. You've been entrusted. Young people, You talk to mom and dad. Mom and dad talk to you about trust all the time. You've been entrusted with something. Wow. What an awesome responsibility. You've been entrusted with something. God's entrusted something to us. Not church worldwide, although that's true. Not Christian worldwide, although that's true. Now I'm looking into your faces and I'm thinking about the cars that are driving by right now. And I'm saying God has entrusted something to us. For about the next eight or nine weeks, we are going to look at that trust and how we're doing and asking ourselves some tough questions. What I'm asking of you to begin that journey that I did last week that wasn't in the bulletin. I know, I messed up. I do that all the time. I'd rather preach than give announcements. If you assign me to do announcements, I'm going to mess it up. But we're going to go through the Transformational Church. It's a book by the Broadman Holman and Lifeway Research. If you don't know, that's the Southern Baptist Convention Press. It's a study that's been done by 7,000 churches across our land, investigation research, that's been done into these churches that are what the authors call transformational churches. That is, churches who are being, to some level or another, successful in the ministry of reconciliation that God has given them and ask some pretty difficult, challenging questions. Well, we like to ask you those questions. We want to take, um, we want to, we want to put our hand on our pulse. We want, we want to investigate how we're doing. And, and so, you've seen some instructions on the city. You're going to see some more. If you are not on the city, haven't gotten on the city up to this point, I'm asking you, please see John Gadosh out in the, in the foyer here. See Keith, who's tech. Dave is really good at all this technological. Don't ask me. I don't even. They just put me on it and say, do this. And uh, so I'm probably not the person to ask, but get on the city. Take our transformational church assessment. Let's just ask. Let's pull it together and show it to you uh, about what it says about the life of our church. And then in that process, let's begin to ask God and really put fingers on it. None of this ozone layer I call kind of whimsical ideas. Let's say, how is it that we can be on mission? Let's change our mindset. No Stockholm syndrome. No CD, high CD, blah, 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 whatever those numbers were. None of that destructive pattern that we may think that we're doing right things, but we're not actually. Let's take an assessment. Let's get our mindset 
God's mindset. Because, and I'm finished, the same word that's in 2 Corinthians 3.18 is in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Two, please. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves a holy and living sacrifice, which is acceptable to God, which is his, our spiritual service of worship. And be being, again, see that? Greek present participle. Be being transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's where it's going to start. It's going to start when God gets into our hearts and minds and says, be on mission in Boynton Beach as if you were a missionary church in the Congo or in Chad, entrusted with the, you're the only light. I know we're not the only, but as if you're the only light of the ministry of reconciliation, get that mindset and hold on to it. Pray with me. Lord, trans. Form our minds that we might be set free because of your spirit in us, changing us to be like you from wherever we are to wherever you want us to be. Lord, from wherever this church is to where you want us to be, make us a transformational community. Ministers of that transformation, reconciling the world to yourself. And Lord, I pray that we would not be clouded by a mindset that is destructive, but that mindset that gives life. I pray in Jesus' name.